Hi, Tom. Good afternoon. Hiya, how are you doing? You well? Yeah. Good. Hello. Good day. Hi, Oliver. Hi. Hey, Oliver. How are you? Everyone have a good weekend? Uh, yeah, eventful, but yeah. Okay. Eventful, okay. <laughs> See. Spent an hour and a half on the side of the motorway. My tire blew out. Oh, yeah, that's not great. I well, I I, I share in your experience somewhat. My son, my uh, my my uh, senior high school student, uh, went to a friend's graduation um, in another state. Drove there on on Friday and had to drive back on Friday night and call he woke me up at 12 30 at night to tell me he was on the side of the highway with a flat tire and he needed oh. help <laughs> so yeah I uh was that was an interesting experience doing that over FaceTime uh, yeah <laughs> not the nicest thing in the world but... no, a little stressful when you see the cars rip, zipping by at a 55 miles an hour 65 miles an hour I know. I had my daughter and my dog with me as well. It's, it's oh, yeah. Not nice. Not nice at all. Anyway, we're all safe. Let's, let's find out. Uh, right. Dish, dish. Um, meeting notes in the chat. Uh, right, I have got a hard stop at half four today, but obviously carry on after I've gone. Um, just let you know I'll, I'll need to drop off. Um, so I think last week was the big 5G event. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call went. I think, Taylor, I saw some posts from you about it. Yeah, um, it was an interesting event. I've never been to that one. So I, I think it was uh, um, there was a good mix of hardware focused um, exhibits and some talks, uh, government and um, government programs, rural and private 5G uh, discussions, which ended up bringing in a lot of service providers that are more focused on that, and including like Metro, um, Metro, smaller metro and, and as well as large metro uh, type of uh, communication solutions. And some of that ended up going into like Wi-Fi 6, overlapping into 5G and how those can be hybrid type setups. And that one, everything from people talking about deployments that are either active or going in right now uh, to folks that are doing like, I think next the next generation type research or building out hardware demos and products. Uh, IEEE folks were there. So it was a pretty mixed event with R&D all the way through whatever you would think on the, the business side. And um, we ended up with a, a pretty good interest. I mean, we were definitely a small small presence for the whole thing, but the the entire event was smaller than, say, KubeCon, so it's easier to get around and speak with people. But um, had tried to get 
more of the service providers aware, the, the smaller ones specifically. And, and then on the larger ones, um, spoke with several folks from like Verizon and T-Mobile. And, you know, normally uh, we've had the most engagement for the cloud native telecom work that we've all been doing from Deutsche Telekom and, um, you know, of course, Vodafone Tom and, and I would say a lot more of the European rather than the North America on the larger telecom. Now we've had stuff from service providers like Charter, um, Cox has been interested. They're, they have a cloud, a telecom cloud, that's now a lot further along than the last time that they were talking with us. In any case, uh, there's interest in the Cloud Native Telco Day, um, interested in the working group as well as the certification and test suite, including from some vendors and um, a lot of system integrators. There was a lot of system integrators there. But I did post what I think the comment there was, I, I put I, as much as I could, I tried to put uh, summaries on LinkedIn. So of, of some of the panels and talks that I was at and uh, Lucina Watson, um, they've, they've shared and put some stuff up as well. We'll, st we'll be, gathering up more of the content that we you know we've had and and then trying to get more folks to join okay cool and 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 so there was there was interest in joining the working group was there as well as as well as kind of using the test suite and so on yeah some of the questions were actually about if where the resources should be allocated. And then it came down to what type of folks would be engaged. And so then those discussions need to happen to decide on, you know, are, are they wanting to be hands-on for something like um, implementing tests in the test suites or they were definitely interested in writing up um, challenges and those would be, the working group would be a good place for that. Okay, yeah, that's good. There was a lot of talk about automation and programmable networks that there was a whole set of talks in one track that were related to that. And I saw it in other discussions and it came up when folks were just talking about problems and challenges outside of that. So uh, NEFIO would be you know, an example, GitOps uh, in general, as far as using um, those patterns that you see that are under what's called GitOps, all of that would be very applicable for a lot of the automation. And, and then I think there's a blend between uh, private 5G, um, stuff that you're seeing over in ORAN and uh, the automation end to end that a lot of them have, have talked about. But, I mentioned the the multi network, which some of y'all were have been seeing the pull request for multi network uh, mm -hmm. for adding a new network object that expands on the capabilities. And I I think that from like the network automation point is going to be a a key change in automating for Kubernetes in a non-vendor specific way that probably has a, a pretty big 
impact on innovating how you do that. And a lot of new projects are probably going to really push forward and we may have new 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 projects pop up as a result too. I expect stuff like um, Danm to uh, take the uh, ad support. I'm interested to see what happens with projects like Multis and everything. Uh, the new network object from the multi network is supposed to be a, a superset and it'll support CNIs. So you could just continue acting like a normal CNI, but then you won't be taking advantage of the other stuff. So, anyways, I put forward as any of those type of things that seem to be related so that we'd have entry points for discussion with the folks and be follow-ups and trying to get more engagement for the next few weeks as well as um mwc um in september mwc las vegas so there's a request to some of them want to meet um, if there's enough folks that are going from CNF Working Group, then maybe we can put something together. We're seeing what else can happen for that. You guys have any questions? Otherwise, um, that'll be it as far as my summary. Uh, no, I don't think I've got any questions. Sounds like there was loads of good conversations there. Um, certainly sharing the challenges, um, that's always useful. Gives us stuff to work from. So, so Taylor, do you know if they, they are going to um, make available the, the recordings or like, a, or do you know if anyone can have access to the to the videos? I don't, I was wondering the same. Um, no, no, thank you. Yeah, it's on my list of things to look into more this week. So I didn't see anything mentioned. Did Watson, Lucina, did you all see anything or Drew about re recordings for all of the talks? I haven't seen anything myself either. All right. Yeah, we'll uh, share them for sure if we if we find this. Cool. Thank you. Um. So the next event on the list is the LFN DTF, which is virtual only um, CFP that should be extended to the end of today because um, there were so many bank holidays at the end of last week um, across Europe, certainly. Um, so if anyone does have any ideas for that um, in terms of the work in between the test suite and the Anakit projects, for example, um, then the CFP is still open today for that. Um, other than that, the only th I've added another one here, which I know is on at the same time as the Open Source Summit, but there's a um, TM form DTW. Um, event, which is perhaps more kind of telco IT focused, but could be interesting in terms of the use cases for telco, potentially. Um, and not long now, four weeks until the CFP closes for KubeCon North America, which has a new Telco and Edge track. Uh, 
Um, anything else on events that we want to talk about before we move on? Okay. Uh, please and uh, everyone keep trying to help get sponsors for the Cloud Native Telco Day. Mm -hmm. Definitely make sure it happens and if we get enough sponsors and it could you know, expand either a full day or a um, remote virtual, which has been asked every time. We need to get sponsorship to support that. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip a, an item. So next week is public holiday in the US and also the UK and possibly elsewhere. Um, just double check. Uh, yeah, and Germany possibly. Um, so do we want to keep or cancel the working group? I think given the three co-chairs are either a US or UK based. I'm going to suggest we cancel it unless anyone objects. Okay. So then, so Victor, you wanted to talk through this proposal and some of the comments that have been made in particular. Yeah, so I guess it's, it's, it's a good time to start focusing on, on some proposals. Like, uh, I guess this is a good candidate. I mean, Oliver and I, we were having an interesting chat the other day. And I guess it, it, it's better to uh, try to focus in, in, in certain um, proposals. Probably this could be a good candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, try to, to address the comments and, and move forward like a, um, yeah I know that this could be a very controversial topic um, but but I guess we have a lot of uh, information uh, to to, uh, to to do something like if, if this is something that we can make it like a best practice let's move forward and, and submit the proposal if this is not a best practice probably <laughs> Uh, we have to document why it's not a best practice and, and uh, what, why and, all, and document all the reasons why we didn't consider this as a best practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, reading the comments, like uh, for example, Gregory was saying, like uh, his his main um, main point is like best in performance. So. Um, so I don't know if, um, yeah, definitely there are, there are pros and cons. <laughs> so I just I just want to bring this this particular uh, now and try to um, do something like a like uh, like try to find like a sweet spot where where anyone can feel agree or or disagree. <laughs> Do you ever get a response to your suggestion? Well, uh, that's what I found in, in, in most of the, the, the relevant topics about this. Um, what I have heard is, is like a, the best practice is to use a, like a additional um, or an external like a service to manage the different processes. Um, I found like a some tools like a super visor D or tiny or all these things um 
the last week, uh, Ian uh, just just put the latest comments. Um, so regarding, um, yeah, probably the same thing. Like, uh, where is this going? <laughs> Basically, I guess it's like a best way to summarize it. Um, now that we have like a more for more quorum here, like I would like to to hear uh, your ideas and, and know what what you think about if this is could be a, a good potential like a um, best practice or like if not like a what what do you think like a... so the some of the comments and there's um, make this a little bit confusing it overlaps a couple of things so this is a the the issue was put forward as a best practice to discuss and then and and it could be documented and put forward there's comments in here that are related to the cnf certification mm -hmm. and not saying whether it's a best practice it's just saying remove it from the uh well there's three categories in the cert cna certification essential and uh, normal and bonus and one of the comments from gergay just is referring to the certification and whether it should be essential or not so it i want to make sure like how are we talking about this because we could respond to a piece and then it's not relevant to the whole context of what it means in the certification versus is this this idea in general a best practice okay we can talk about it that way should it be part of a set of tests in a in a certification that's a different thing is it going to be in the test suite at all uh, there's a, pull, a related pull request that's just over in the test suite and um, I just want to make sure when we're discussing this, we're, what are we talking about? And I will bring up the certification just momentarily, and then I want to bring it back to say, what are we going to discuss? On the certification side, there's a whole set of tests, and it's not pass, fail, you're done. It's how are you doing in an area? You can have, if, if you are passing a certain number of tests, you can still pass the, the certification. And when we're looking at potentially saying that certification may have different levels, then it would be how many tests. So this is unlike some tests where they are going to be, you must pass everything. So I think that's important. And then related specifically to this idea as a best practice, this is related to microservice best practices, and we could go down to an, a specific area, but there's other tests that are in progress to go into the test suite, which could also be written up as best practices, which would be related. At which point on the certification side, you could say, well, we passed three out of four of those related tests. We didn't pass the one process type, or we passed it and we passed, a couple of others. We still are showing that we're following best practices for microservices. Uh, likewise, if we're looking at what are we doing for documenting and talking about guidance in the working group with our, we have a CNF dev um, document that we're trying to write up and fill out. To me, this would be related to the grouping that you can see in other best practice guidelines where you have a subset of practices that may get into more details, but you can still talk about the higher level. Like the principle of least privilege, it seemed to be general agreement that yes, you should try to follow that. Now, when you talk about specific practices to get to least privilege, you may or may not choose to follow those during implementation. But the idea that least privilege principle is good and should usually be followed, just as a guideline, there, there was no question on that, including from anyone that 
would say a specific one, you could find documentation from any of those groups. So I want to start from there and, and try to, what is our context? And I know Watson, you, you were actively working on the, those newer related ones, but what, what do we want to do context and focus here in the working group? Did you have some thoughts, Victor, on that since you put this forward? Oh, I don't know. Um, so I think that Watson is going to answer, like, or. Do we want to focus on moving this forward as a, a proposal for the cert for the I'm sorry, not certification for the working group? So that we're adding it to that. Uh, can you open that dev CNF dev doc, Vic, uh, Victor or Tom, whoever? I think this is your screen, Tom. This this one. No, the uh, the Google Doc and the and the working group repo for. Oh, right. yeah. Best CNF dev under docs. I'm going to share it in chat as well. If I can find the chat, there it is. We saw. Yeah. So this has categories and areas, and and then we'd be adding, you know, best practices under any reason under any area that we think is the most focused for it. If if this makes sense for the categories, but the the idea is to add recommended best practices here, and we're not talking requirements. I I want to restate this. Some some folks already know. We're not saying hard requirements. Everyone must meet every best practice that is listed here. This is a guide. It's recommendations for people to follow. The CNF certification is a separate thing. The CNF certification would be, would be looking towards best practices that are um, listed here and going, well, here's some that we are listing in the certification. And if we have different levels of the certification, then some of the best practice we may say are essential, which are strong recommendations, or and get maybe weighted more in if you're following them or not. And then some are going to be bonus where we may say, this is good. And if you're doing it, we know it's going to make it easier for deployment or automation or whatever it's for. You got to step away, Tom. Yeah, sorry. Uh, apologies. No worries. I didn't want to uh, stop you mid sentence, but yeah, I've, I'll put a link to the doc that I was just sharing in the chat. Okay. Um, but yeah, sorry. I need to. I need to go. I understand. Um, Thank you, Victor. Can you take over the screen share? Sure. Um, uh, I suggest that we focus on what's we're recommending in that. CNF dev best practices, which, you know, we may expand this as, as we're looking at stuff like highlighting practices from Nefio, which is about automation, or GitOps, which is related to a, a larger part of the life cycle. And um, it may expand beyond what, what people are just thinking CNF developers, but we could just think telco cloud native telecom best practices for cloud native telecom development, something like that, and operations, whatever. But as we're trying to publish something, that was that's really the point in the, in the working group, coming together and talking about what are the challenges, what are the use cases related for context, and then what can we say are best practices to solve those cloud native and Kubernetes native best practices that we we're saying and would recommend for the community to follow. That's our goal as, as the working group. So 
I suggest that from that that GitHub issue for discussion that we focus on how would we recommend it? If we want to have a different discussion about certification, then we should do that as a separate conversation. Okay, uh, for me, uh, this particular proposal seems to be related with, um, with the microservice uh, area. I don't know if you have a place to, to put it. Um, so, I think that that particular proposal falls in this in this category. Um, yeah, I know that there are pros and way, uh, different ways to implement it, but I guess like uh, it, it definitely makes uh, the, the manage of microservices easier. So, what do you think? Do you think that that could be a, a possible way to? To associate this uh, proposal. I mean, Victor, I think it, and I guess Taylor as well. I, I think I, I agree with what everything everything Taylor just said. I mean, I think the, the it, it just feels like this is a best practice proposal. I agree, it probably goes under microservices. I think it just, you know, I don't want to say it got derailed, but maybe I mean. There's probably a way for us to handle that when we have questions that sort of take the take it you know causes the best practice to take a turn or or sort of the the comments take a turn on the on the uh, on the, the proposal just to bring it back to the, this is a best practice proposal and so I guess it's we don't have to worry about certification or anything like that and I think that's pretty clear to me so I think it's just a question of how we take this now to at what point does this become a best practice does do we all give it a looks good to me or what is it that we need to do to get to that state. Mm -hmm. uh, yes agreed this proposal um you know i i opened this issue so this was when i opened this it was for putting forward a best practice in the working group um i've added a comment in the google doc i want to put one i gotta fix my login here again on github but I'm going to add one into this issue. If we're going to do something for um, the CNS certification, let's open a different issue for that. All right, let's dig into this just from a best practice. And I don't know about responding live for anybody that hadn't. I just saw Ian's. I hadn't even seen the message until uh today so but anyone else is feel free to talk and what's not to ask if you can just give feedback not on on the ian stuff unless you want to but the general reason this was a best practice i know that maybe we link the microservice uh drop a link to the microservice article that um, you worked on and um, which has a lot of references to other people talking about this area. I'm going to stop talking. I'd, I'd like for you to speak into this with focus. This is a recommendation. This one process type is a recommendation. Why are we recommending it? What, what link you, you're talking about? Um, I, the, as far as the article, is that what you're asking about, Victor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need I I am trying to look for it right now, okay. so I don't I haven't put it in. Yeah, I mean, from from my point of view, like I I I, I think that discussion is fine. Like, I, I'm, it's, it's it's nice to receive like a different perspectives and, and opinions of all this, but eventually we have to move forward. Like, I mean, it's, 
if, if this idea is it does it, it's not making sense that's fine but i guess even in that case again we have to document and, and say why does it make sense to have it yep. like maybe create like an anti-pattern or something like that uh, and if this definitely makes sense like uh with several exceptions or like something to consider also we need to document it so that's basically my idea like um I cannot refuse any any of the things that has been discussed here. All of these are very valid points. Even even when I remember, like we received like a feedback in in LinkedIn, uh, someone uh, also pointing or like saying something about this particular thing. So it's nice. Like uh, uh, it's great to receive this kind of uh, attention and. and and, and different opinions but again like i guess eventually we have to reach that point where where, where we have to um, deliver something and can you all hear me now i can hear you we can hear you now great oh, okay all right yeah yeah um so and i think it's interesting or it's useful or even mandatory to when you're talking about architectural decisions, you should kind of put forward the trade offs. That's really what we're trying to, to do. And uh, the trade offs here are from what, what I can tell there's a performance trade off versus are you basically writing your own sophisticated supervisor or orchestrator? So if you have multiple process types, not processes, I see mean, that being confusing, process types. So to simplify it, if you had a web server and a database inside of one container, those are two concerns and process types, sets of processes. You would have to have something smart enough to know the life cycle of both at the top end. And it would basically be the equivalent of what Kubernetes does at, as the top process. Because you have a to two totally different reasons for restarting, monitoring, and all of that. That's really all of the arguments go under that, I would and when you're able to separate all that, you have deployability and your logging, reasoning, and all of these other things that come into play. I would say that that is um, the only reason why this is even a consideration is because of the performance requirements of um, network and network functions. If we were to say, nope, we're going to go ahead and put all the process types we want inside the container or whatever, just don't even think about calling it a microservice. The rest of the world is just going to say, we're just using the word just for cool points. That's, that's really what um, it comes down to. So, you know, that's where it comes. So as far as saying it's a best practice, not a requirement, but a best practice. Uh, I just don't even, I have no idea how this is even a discussion really. Um, but what's another interesting thing is one of the critiques of the, the article is actually saying we're not going far enough. Like how can you possibly think that you would need to even worry about putting more than one uh, or um, separating the concerns in, by container. You have pods, so you can have multiple containers. The person didn't even understand the article. So they're wanting even more. Um, my position in the article is that, oh no, we have to worry about low latency and all this stuff. So here's some things that you can do to try to work within the system, like inner process communication that will increase speed between processes and all of this. So, um, that that's kind of the high level, I would say. I would say for Ian, he probably needs to read the article because he's, I mean, there's some things that he's saying that are we talking about only one process per container? No, we're talking about process types, these types of things. Um, I also address 
that there's new scheduler um, provisioning or um, I guess configuration for Kubernetes that can allow you to do certain things um, uh, that before it couldn't. So there's lots of things there, but I'd like to see um, more on the performance side um, from the network, from the telecommunications people. So, so what's on the, the example that you you provide? I mean, it's kind of very radical. Like, a, I mean, obviously, uh, try to separate like database from the front end. It's like very obvious. Um, well, at least for me, like, a, but what about those cases? For example, uh, what I have seen is like using memcache inside of a front con, from the front front end application. Um, that is a little bit more tricky, right? Like, uh, because uh, as you said, like uh, that, you get a, a little bit more performance, but you have two different process, process types that run in the same container. Um, I mean, even even for me, like uh, I mean, it's better. Like, uh, I mean, I'm in favor to separate this sign of uh, um, process types in different containers, um, but. Well, anyway, like I'm also like in favor, like a, like not trying to re rewrite and having everything like a, like trying to use like a additional um, process manager instead of a container. So, do you think that we have addressed those particular use cases where, like, uh, I mean, it's not clear, like, uh, or the, the advantage to to separate them. The, the, the catch portion versus um so, so I don't know if we have addressed these particular cases where 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 things are very very tied together and so are you saying that in the, the example of using a cache yeah. separate from the um let's whatever functional uh um application process that you're doing yeah that's a bad example or you're saying that that's a more realistic example yeah i guess that that's more realistic example like uh or at least a little a little bit more hard to to distinguish the the separation and the benefits mm -hmm. so how, how can we address those particular cases like uh, where, where definitely we, we have a a better like a performance um in favor of, of um maybe um architectonic <laughs> design or whatever yeah so i mean that's a uh i think that's a good example to, to reason about so you have a functional cache that only you are using only the, I say you as the process that's inside the container using, or is it being used by other containers? Mm, yeah, that's a good point as well. Right. So um, I would just say that if that functional cache, so that's one process, has a life cycle, reasons to restart, all of these things that are different than the actual um, application, let's say, the other process that's inside the container, then you've got a trade-off, you've got a problem, the decision to make. Now, why not have it in another container? Well, someone would say, well, in order to reference it, um, I need to go out to the network. No, you can use inter process communication. You don't have to go out to the network. That still works within this uh, environment that we're talking about. Another thing I wanted to make sure that I think, um, Sometimes people, for whatever reason, they're calling threads a process. So no, the thread is not a process. New threads is not what we're talking about. Do all the threads you want. You're going to do shared memory, do whatever you want inside of them, fine. But we're talking about total processes. So we're talking about execution and memory isolated from each other. That's two processes. Sometimes they call it a P thread within the Linux community. That's a thread. 
not not a process. So that's fine. We're not talking about that. Um, for some reason, within these examples, someone is saying, I want to start up a new process, a new OS process. I want to tell operating system, start up, allocate new memory, isolate it and all that, and start it over there. Put it inside of this container. For what reason? That's what we're trying to figure out, we're trying to find out real examples of that um, on why you would do that and not have it in another container. So there are there are some slowdowns that happen when you have it in another container. I addressed them in the article. One of them is security. You can you can do some things where you can try to you can reduce some of the security provisioning. You want more speed. That's a, again, it's a trade-off again. So, um, but you're handling all of that within one one pod. Um, yeah. Also, now that you you mentioned about security, like uh, I mean, one process can have different security requirements versus another one, right? Like, uh, for example, your application maybe requires certain privilege that maybe. The cash portion doesn't need it, like, um, or they need a completely different set of uh, uh, permissions. So also, like, like managing the the, sec the security permissions, like, for every single process is like a different. Like, if we want to follow like the less privileged uh, <laughs> best practice that we create, yeah, I guess like the best way to do it is isolating the, the process uh, types and and manage their permissions per process type instead of like having multiple uh, processes, having all the, the, the privilege, uh, I think so. Yeah. So I have in the article, I'll just read out some things that are arguments for, from the trade-off perspective, on why you would want to have one concern per, per, per container or one process type per, per container. Um, one of them is isolation. That's what you just brought up. So isolation, where processes use the container namespace system, they are protected from interfering with one another, right? So you can lock down security on that level. There's pod level security, which is multiple containers per pod. And then there's also container level, right? So scalability, scaling one process or process type is easier to reason about than, than scaling multiple types. This can be for completely, um, for complexity reasons. So one process type is harder to scale than multiple process types, or because the rate of change is different, but is different. So one process needs to be increased based on different conditions than other processes. So again, scalability for your that example of the cache versus the application in the same container. Okay. We need to, um, we want to scale up the cache. We need more processes for the cache. Is it hard coded to one process or can you increase it? Remember, as far as talking about cloud nativeness and all of this, one of the arguments is we want to develop things so that they can scale up. So by increasing processes or pods or whatever, and those different processes have different um, um, arguments or rationale or conditions for scaling up. What's the, what's the, what are the implications of that? You need that, all of that is, should be configuration declared based off of the process. But if they're both inside of the container, you're essentially writing your own orchestrator and having to do all that yourself, right? So again, complexity reasons or, or, or what have you. So that's a scalability argument. You have testability, it's easier to test when the processes are separate. Deployability. So when the processes binary and dependencies are deployed in a container, the deployment is coarse grain and relative to the rate of change of the binary and the container. But a fine grain uh, deployment relative to the rate of change of the other processes and their dependencies, this makes deployments adjustable to where um, when a change happens, in your dependency tree instead of uh, re redeploying everything in lockstep. So essentially what I'm saying is if you, when you have a process, you can have a process that's all, all of it is spawned from one binary. In your example, like having a cache versus an application, that's two different binaries. 
And so those all have their own dependencies and everything behind them. But now you're having to deploy them in lockstep with each other. Guess what? When you have a security deployment or patch for one of them, you've got to redeploy both instead of it having being per container. That makes sense. So composability is another reason. Telemetry, someone posted in here, it's easier for, um, it, instead of having your logs interleave with each other based off the processes, they're separate and you can, you can um, easily reason about them per container. And as far as orchestration, I would say orchestration is the number one. You're writing your own, what I call a sophisticated supervisor something that knows when to restart, the order to restart, all of this other stuff inside of the container. You're essentially rewriting Kubernetes and its declarative configuration, all that stuff inside of it. I just don't see how, I know old school programming, that's what we did, but you know, this is, we're trying to get away from that. We're trying to have agnostic orchestrators. So I'll set up and let people Comments. Well, basically, what I what I was reading about that is um, so so. I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm agree with you. Like, uh, it doesn't make sense to to rebuild the wheel. Like, and try to put everything there. Um, so probably the recommendation, beside just one single. Um, process type per container was to making sure that your application is managing properly the, the, the OS signals. So I guess like it's something to, to just keep, to keep in mind as a, as a developer, like, okay, uh, if the OS is going to raise this particular signal, I need to catch them and propagate properly to the, to the orchestrator, which in this case is, is very like to manage every, properly mm -hmm. Kubernetes, like mm -hmm. not saying that has to be this, um these internal uh, supervisors um so probably that that could be only just to consider like a or or uh, as part of the best practice like okay once that you separate these things in 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 one process per container also consider like uh that that process signal properly if 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 not this is going to you're going to lose some of the capabilities but Probably this is something a little bit different, or, or maybe another best practice to, to be considered, but associated with this particular case, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I addressed those in the paper too. You have to do those as well. <laughs> it yeah. isn't a either or. You have to do, so those aren't sophisticated, what I'm calling a sophisticated supervisor even though it's a super, um, super, supervisor D, run it, monitor it, and all that stuff like that. Those will do two things. One of them is um, pass on, they will do proper signaling. So if you say, I want to do a graceful termination, right? Or, the, or Kubernetes says, hey, you over there, I'm, I want you to gracefully terminate, right? And then the prop PID one, the main process, accepts that signal and is able to communicate it on to the other uh, processes. It says, please shut down nicely. Now, why, what are the implications of that? Just to make sure everyone's on the same page. If you have files open and you don't shut down, you don't close those files, you will corrupt the data in those files. Mm -hmm. That's what's at stake here. So you need to handle graceful termination you will have a serious problem. So again, you, we can go off into the rabbit hole here. All, you have things that handle state, like writing to hard drives and all that stuff. You know, and then you have things that don't do that. Having that all interleave, that's another problem. But now we're not talking about that. So handling signals, so graceful termination, having the capability of doing that, that would be the PID1 needs to be a process manager something capable of passing on signals. So supervisor D, run it, mon it, tinny, dumb in it, S6, those types of things, like we talked about in the paper. That's one problem. Another problem is zombies. 
handling zombies. PID one needs to be smart about when the process dies, that it doesn't just stay out there. It needs to um, run a check. It basically needs to do a call, I forget the name off the top of my head, to, turn, to kill the process. Um, and to remove it from the pit table, essentially. What, what, what are the implications of that? There's a finite amount of PIDs that are available and you will blow up the system if you do not. That's, the, that's what are the implications of having zombies. This is, those are two things in addition to you should only run, you know, one process type. So you need to do these things. Um, most programming languages are pretty good about handling signals. So if you were to run Java as your PID one, it can handle signals and handle all of its processes and all that. Now, will it handle the zombies out of the box? Well, what we're finding is oftentimes no, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, so those are things where having a PID one that handles zombies, that you know handles zombies correctly, is a good thing. Uh, so yeah, you need to do these as well. And it's recommended in the paper. And, you know, as an aside, we have these now as part of uh, in the test suite. Um, checking to see if you have these top end um, PID one, uh, um, something within this list. Also, do you handle zombies? We actually create a zombie, attach it to your process and then send, uh, kill it. And then if it doesn't get erased from the pig, we know you don't handle zombies. That's a fun fact. A lot of containers out there are not handling zombies properly. Um, even Kubernetes itself had problems, problems with zombies. Um, SCD, I should say. And then handling signaling. I have examples in the paper of um, GitLab, very subtle and insidious errors happen when you don't handle signaling. Very hard to trap, um, track down. Uh, um, so yeah, all of this, by the way, is exacerbated when you have more than one process type. Yeah. <laughs> worse, made worse. So there. Well, uh, we are reaching the, the top of the hour. Um, so I don't know if someone else has any any additional comment on this or what could be the the action that we can take on, on this particular topic. Uh, can we start writing the, the best practice or like? Uh Victor, do we do you know if we have a draft document for this one? I was trying to look for it. I know we do. We started creating Google draft docs, but I didn't find a link for this one. And I'm I'm trying to see if we have it somewhere. But that would be the what I would suggest. Let's write it up like we were doing for the other practices as a draft so that we can see. I think some of, of the problem with why this is sitting so long is the content is linked out to other places and they would have everyone would have to go read like this article that Watson was talking about there was a lot of other content um this idea of separating concerns that's a pre-cloud native people talk about concerns as far as separation concerns for a long time so if we can take all of that including like going into the article where watson just went through and talked about specific things that are addressing these questions and write it up into the proposal i think it'll be easier for folks to come in and see how we're recommending it so that's what I'd say we, we focus on. We'll write up a draft, source it from content available, this article and other places, and then uh, link that into this issue. Mm -hmm. 
and then at that point we can um you know put it forward if if we have enough in the draft uh well when we have enough in the draft and then we can put in a pull request to to add it as a best practice recommendation okay well that sounds like a good plan like I, maybe i can start collecting that in the draft and and put the link there By the way, if, 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 mm -hmm. if anyone has any other particular comment or like, um, I, I will invite you to, to put um, your thoughts in this particular issue. Uh, that way we can um, also consider for, for the draft and, and make it better, I guess. All right, uh, Taylor, you're, you're going to say something else? Like I, I just interrupt you. <laughs> oh, it's it's fine. I'm I didn't find uh, everywhere that I'm looking. I'm not finding the, a draft, so I'm I'm going to create one over in the working group folder, okay. and I'll share the link. I'll add it to um, I'll add the link into the GitHub, and then anyone that wants to help, um, you can jump right in the document or ping me on Slack and up for a working session as well, where we can focus on this. All right, well, um, the next meeting is going to be canceled, I guess. Uh, so we will see you in, in two weeks. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.